Thank you all for joining us for the grant writing workshop. Joining us today are Dr. Peter Gray, professor and undergraduate coordinator in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, we have Dr. Gwen Marchand, Associate Dean for the Research and Sponsored Projects, Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Educational Psychology and Higher Education. And we have Dr. Harun Steven, Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Construction. They are going to be discussing grant writing and providing tips on how to translate ideas into fundable proposals. So I'm going to share my screen now and hand it over to them to get us started. And I'm going to start. This is Peter Gray. And what we're going to do is the three of us will take turns leading different uh, discussions of slides as we go through uh, the sequence of slides ahead. And then while each of us will take our respective turns guiding some of the initial discussion, others will chime in. We'll also have some uh, pauses at strategic points as we go through these slides for uh, questions that can be raised. And as uh, Nevena noted through chat, you can post uh, questions that we can uh, keep an eye out for. So here we go in the world of grant writing. Look who's joined us. It's baby Yoda. We all need a pick me up in 2020. And fortunately, later this month, baby Yoda returns for the second season of The Mandalorian. And he's here to wish, wish us all success in our grant writing endeavors. Thank you, baby Yoda. We will take to heart your kindness and generosity and whatever's in that cup. That's probably not enough for us to share, but thank you, baby Yoda. Why should you seek funding or participate in grant writing? We've listed some key ideas on this slide. If you are a grad student whose research is contingent upon funding, then that is your most obvious answer. That for many of you to do the work that costs money, whether in the US or somewhere else internationally, uh, there, there is a price tag attached to that. Uh, it can be for your own living expenses, for the, the costs of a research project, uh, a host of things that can go into the budget, but the, uh, the the key thing oftentimes is that you need funding in order to advance your research agenda. This may be for your master's, your doctoral research, uh, and so forth. Uh, what else? What you're applying for for grad school or funding for as a grad student is also helping set up your uh, your future trajectory. If you are applying for positions, including tenure track faculty positions, postdocs, and so forth, after you finish or towards the end of your PhD or uh, degree program here at UNLV, uh, the record of your funding will likely be an instrumental component of how you're evaluated. Of course, some of that will, de will depend on the trajectory you pursue. But for anyone who has aspirations for tenure track faculty positions, increasingly the expectation of external, external funding is codified and is quite competitive. and uh, this will be an important element for your professional profile moving forward. Uh, moving down to postgraduate life, besides um, what was just noted, um, if you are preparing for that longer term horizon, then the trajectory you're helping establish now for your grant writing and funding success will be part of your trajectory in which one grant can help get the next, can in turn help get the next, and that's how in turn um, success can pile upon success. It's also a way to help foster your publications, your conference presentations, uh, things that are less obvious right now, but let's say the, the track you initiate early in your uh, grad trajectory helps set the stage many years later for your ability as, say, a tenure track faculty position uh, to help get funding for your own students or also generate overhead, the IDCR acronym there, for the institution where you're a part, where the administrators like Dr. Moshan will say, Thank you uh, for getting that external funding uh, and giving the institution some overhead out of it that helps support the staff that in turn allows supporting resources that help you get future grant writing success. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. Marchand for the next sequence of slides. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in and if for some reason I, my sound cuts out, just wave your hands and panic and I'll, I'll panic as well. So um, in terms of developing a funding plan, so 
So the way I like to think about this is what makes sense for where you are in your research and both in, both in terms of your own research path and where you are in your education and your field, but also where the research is in the life of um, in its own life cycle. So if you think about that, um, you might be jumping into or coming into a lab, for example, where there's a research project that's been going on for a long period of time and they might be uh, have a long history of funding related to that project. So if you are invited to work on that, you might think to yourself, okay, what can I gain from this? Um, how can this feed into my long-term goals? So perhaps thinking about if you can be a funded person on that project, if you can help with developing grant writing skills, if you might think about um, how that experience, you might be able to carve a piece out of that for a dissertation or a culminating experience. But the idea would be that that grant activity and seeking out grant activities, even as a student, can be really instrumental in shaping your long, your short and long-term research goals in terms of where you are in your education and what you're hoping to do after you finish school, as well as where your own research interests are in terms of sort of the a uh, culmination of knowledge around a topic as well as the project itself and its life cycle. So you want to consider your career development related to your grant in relation to your grant activities. So again, how will your involvement in this particular grant opportunity, whether you're helping to write a literature review or whether you're um, bringing the idea to your faculty, to your faculty partner and saying, I think this is really great. It sort of fits with what you've already been doing. Can we write a grant together on this? And potentially asking to be more of a senior personnel member on that grant, if that's allowable. Um, but thinking about, be very planful. So when I give um, grant presentations to faculty, I always tell them to think about a grant trajectory, just like you would think about a research, developing your program of research. So what do you need to do to build upon, just like Dr. Gray said, what do you need to do to build upon um, your funding so that grant begets grant begets grant, but also that the skills you develop beget the next skill beget the next skill. Also thinking about, have you ever written a grant before? If you've never written a grant before, jumping right in and trying to advocate for getting a waiver so that you can be a principal investigator on a National Science Foundation grant is probably not gonna be the best use of your time. Instead, thinking about looking for doctoral research grants or trying to uh, gain some experience in as a, as a student investigator or as a GA in helping with the grant. Also thinking about whether there are resources you can access that are intended for your specific career development. You're in a sweet spot right now. Uh, you're early in your careers and people want to fund you. They want to support you. So many of the large agencies have grant opportunities that are specifically geared towards students. Um, some are geared towards supporting postdocs. And then there's other ways that they're not grants specifically for research, but they're grants that can support your research. So gaining um, a gaining a grant for learning a particular um, analytic technique or developing a particular skill or a grant that's going to allow you to go work with someone as some sort of summer foundation or summer fellowship. Those are all pieces that may not seem like these large research grants, but they are foundational for letting you gain access to different opportunities and agencies that can then help uh, further your career development. The other thing to think about, and sometimes I think this is lost in the conversation around getting the funding, which is what can you do to maximize your funding efforts and also um, manage your time effectively so that sometimes putting the time and effort into writing a grant can be extensive. So what can you use that information to then contribute back to a paper or a conference submission? Also thinking about ways to work collaboratively, um, which is, can be a really difficult skill, but if you're able to work collabor collaboratively with other faculty or graduate students or postdocs, this can allow you to kind of share the labor so that you can spend time, not all of your time on the singular effort. Also maximizing your UNLV resources. We may have grant writing workshops like the one you're attending or um, grant writing support in your colleges or your departments. Finding out what's available to help you so that you can be more likely to be successful. Okay, and then this bottom one is build in time resilience and reinvestment. Um, grants, especially research grants, are rarely did on the very first try. So thinking about 
how you can maybe take a bigger project that you're interested in doing and splitting it apart, maybe a couple of splitting pieces apart, pieces out so that you can apply to multiple different types of grant opportunities or thinking about starting early so that if you're not funded, you have another chance, those types of issues. And you never take it personally. They're not knocking you. They're just oftentimes if you're not funded, it's because the idea that you have doesn't necessarily fit with the agency's funding priorities. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a quick orientation. I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but there's also different types of funding and, and grants. So we're talking about um, research grants, which can fall into the categories of exploration and seed funding. So pilot funding to support students, for example, or um, seed funding to get a new project off the ground. There's also development grants, which can be related to something like developing a new instrument or a new technique. There's data science efforts. So these can be related in most current iterations right now are using existing data sources like uh, big data sets to be able to mine those to draw some new conclusions. And then there's also intervention research where you're developing an intervention designed to change a behavior or um, designed to produce a different outcome and so you're, there's investment in those spaces. Training grants are going to be directly relevant to you in your, as your time in student, as a student where they are specifically developed, again, this is to help you gain new skills and also to support the research that you're doing as an early career individual. There's accountability and reporting types of funding. So this might be um, doing a program evaluation of the way that, a, that, something, that a, a new service is working. There's service, which is delivery of programs, providing materials or technology. So we, if you've got a core facility, for example, at an institution where you're gonna go in and use a specific piece of equipment, you can get funding for that. Um, there's also community engagement grants. So for those of you that are really interested in community-based research and community partnerships, um, sometimes there's a pretty, there's a, at least right now, there's a, quite a bit of overlap between community engagement and service type of projects, as well as research about what makes for effective community engagement. So there's places where you can get work done there. And then there's infrastructure development, which is again, funding to kind of provide and build up um, some aspect that the institution is in need of. Okay, next. Okay, so types of extramural funding sources. Um, a grant, so you can have those different types of funding, but then a grant is the financial, some quick definitions. This is financial support provided for the provision of the research activity. So you can expect when someone gives you the money that they're not expecting to have a lot of involvement in your actual research process. You will still have to report back to them what's happening with your project, but they are not gonna be involved in the research itself. So grants can come from private, public foundations, private foundations, professional organizations. So if, if you're involved in um, different societies and organizations that are designed around your specific area and interests, there are state and local agencies and federal agencies, and there's probably others as well. So next. There's also contracts. So a contract is a little bit different than a grant, but it can still be used to fund your research. So keep in mind that these are names that matter when you're trying to figure out who is gonna do what with your research, but they all can fund research. So the principal purpose of a, of a transaction with a contract is the acquisition of a property or service for the direct benefit or use of a funder. So let's say you're working with a private um, organization or a business and they want to provide you some funding to develop a new technology for them and then you will provide that back to them. You may not own that technology but you can negotiate in that contract to be able to publish and share the data or to be able to have a piece of that, right? So um, that's an important part that can also fund your research. You just have to make sure that you negotiate that properly. And we have an Office of Sponsored Projects that's here and programs that's here to help you with that. Cooperative agreements are distinguished from a grant in that you can have some substantial involvement from the awarding agency to help carry that out. So let's say, for example, um, you get funded through um, the, the um, an agency that's funding related to substance abuse and mental health. And there's the funder might have technical expertise related to some mechanism for, um, for 
addiction that nobody, very few people in the world have. And so you might end up partnering with that person and there, there may be a little bit more involvement with that agency. And then there's finally there's gifts where this is somebody's just giving you money to do your research. Okay, next slide. Which doesn't happen often, but it's really nice when it does. Okay, so how do you find grants? Um, Really, it's just looking. So there's, if you have an, an office of sponsored projects in your college or in, um, you can often talk to our, our direct office, they can help you set up and figure out how to navigate the different um, search mechanisms. So for example, the general sources bullet pivot, pivot is fantastic. It is a large database that pulls from public and it's a single source. So it pulls from public and private um, databases related to grants, you can set up searches, you have access to this as a UNLV student, and you can, you can arrange this in many different ways to customize a search that can give you notifications to help fund your research. So I highly recommend that you uh, poke around and play with that. There's other broad resources such as unlv.edu, Research OSP Proposal Funding. Again, it kind of lists out different resources. Your colleges also might send out newsletters, for example. I know our college sends out newsletters that sort of curates different funding, um, funding opportunities that arise on a regular basis, and we send that out for individuals to look at. Um, this top one, the different types of grants, if you would look at something like this, this is, for example, a, a site that our college set up where we have developed, um, kind of split out different grant resources available to the different two students. And so these are related to UNLV resources. These are related to different uh, professional organizations in our education fields. Uh, these are related to federal agencies and so on. So, um, and these would all be relevant to non-education students. So I, if you wanna check around and poke around in there, um, we are, Please feel free to, to do so. Okay, next. Also, different federal agencies. Let's say you're really interested in a particular agency and the and the work that they fund. You can um, each one typically has its own funding search site. So you can go to the National Science Foundation. There's Grants.gov that pulls in from uh, several different agencies the IES, the National Institutes of Health. And then another good thing to look at while you're on those federal agencies is to look at what they've recently funded and the programs that you're interested in. So that gives you a really good idea of the type of work that that agency typically funds. And while you're there, you can also look at their mission statements and their priorities, which can also help you think about how you might craft your research statements to better fit the needs of the funders because you're not funding your own research someone else's funding your own research. And there's probably also this, um, there's also gonna be discipline or project specific resources. Peter shared one from anthropology that provides some of the different resources specific to this particular discipline. So a lot of this is just looking around to see what's out there. Okay, next. I think this is you, Dr. Steven. Yes, uh, all right, well, Hello everyone, I am Haroon Stephen and I'll be talking about grant writing. So before I begin with that, I'll share a little personal story with you uh, from my times uh, as a grad student. So I, I'm a master's degree student. The year is 1997 and it's uh, Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. Um, and uh, I'm, I, I'm getting close to my defense. I have, uh, working on my master's degree. And my advisor tells me that, hey, there is an opportunity from government of Japan. Uh, they have a regional educational development program and they're giving money to uh, graduate students to do some additional research on top of their master's degree work. And there'll be money to travel also. So you can go present uh, in a conference on it. So I had no idea what does that mean? by the way. I mean, I, I, yeah, sure, I'm doing research, but I don't know what a grant is. That was a new word for me at that time. So I, but I, I was interested. I got interested. I asked my advisor, okay, I really, this is a good opportunity. I really want to travel. I really would like to extend this work. So what do I need to do? Tell me what do I need to do? And he handed me an announcement. I said, go ahead and read it and educate yourself. 
and uh, I, 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 I spent some time reading it. I got some idea, and then I went back to him with questions. I said, I don't know what this means. I don't know what that means. With some knowledge from him, there were two forms that I had to fill and a two pager I had to write. I put in my application. I got four thousand dollars. By the way, at that time, my monthly stipend was hundred and twenty five dollars. So you can see four thousand dollars was a lot of money. I used that money to do some additional work on top of my master's degree uh, thesis work. And then I got money to travel to Seattle, USA to attend a conference. And that's where I met my PhD advisor and developed that network, which helped me come to my grad's work uh, to US. So the effects and benefits of putting a little bit effort to write a grant are tremendous. So I'm going to tell you how to do it. I, I'm not telling you what I did at that time, but this is kind of the culmination of my experience over time. So some of these things you already know, you know, start early and be organized. You are already as graduate students doing that uh, and learning about that. You, you do it the wrong way and then you realize I have to do it the right way. But from the grant writing perspective, you need to pr propose something that is fundable. And that's that's the key. Uh, it's it, the writing a grant and getting funding is a relationship that you develop with the agency and it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship, which means you are giving something back to the agency and that's why they are going to give you money. And in case if it is public money, then you also have a responsibility towards the public who are basically through their taxpayer taxes funding your your idea. So uh the 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 uh, for example when we when we're funding uh, applying for funding to nasa they are interested in using their satellite data their sensors for public use so your idea will be fundable to them would be different compared to if you're writing an, a grant to nsf that's where they're looking for a scientific push scientific thrust fundamental research uh, so know your agency before you propose an idea. You might be excited about something, but if it is not sellable, it's not going to be fundable. So you always have to repackage it so that you still get to do your fun stuff, but also meet the needs of the agency. Now, there are grad student-led research, uh, research project versus a part of a team. So. Uh, you should definitely look for opportunities where as a grad student, especially PhD students can apply for a funding, which is you just have to show that you have a faculty advisor in that paperwork. But other than that, it is your research. But you can also participate with your advisor who is already putting a proposal together. Be up for and say, how can I help? How can I participate? And um, you might be able to write a small component in it, get an experience on that. but be be willing to 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 put your foot forward for that. Um, tailor your funding guide uh, uh, the tailor two funding guidelines and review criteria. Just keep in mind, for example, NSF is going to be looking at two things: intellectual merit as well as broader perspective, which is true probably for most of the agencies. They want to see that you are providing something unique and novel in your research as well as whatever you're doing has some broader impact. It is going to benefit uh, science. It's going to benefit society and community. So also you will not know that the review panel is not just one discipline sitting there. Generally, it's a bag of mixed people. Um, and so when you're, when you're writing your grant, you're writing to the review panel. So no that there might be people who are outside your discipline who are reviewing your, your grant. So you, you need to be talking to them and um, having a well-balanced uh, grant proposal body is the key there. Uh, if you throw too much jargon of your discipline, that may Im impress one reviewer, but may not impress the other. And your goal is not to impress one reviewer. Your goal is to impress the review panel as a whole. Um, now, the, the next one is, is my favorite. 
I learned the hard way. You have to give yourself permission to fail. Uh, if you always be expect the best from you and expect success from you, um, then, you know, it's hard life, it's hard world, it may not happen. So I am going to share my another experience. Right now I'm, I'm leading a grant of $2.5 million, but that if you just looked at that, it is a, wow, that's a lot of money. This guy got a lot of, you know, big grant. But if I tell you how many grants I have written and failed, that's more than 70 grants. Um, and among those, there were little pieces here and there I would get, uh, but never got a big chance, but I kept writing. I never stopped. There's more failures than successes. So prepare to fail and learn from the failure, but don't stop. Uh, and within UNLV, if you're at UNLV or another university, make sure that you understand that there are other groups on campus who are there to help you. There's Office of Sponsored Program. Within your college, there might be a grant writer. Within our engineering college, there's a person who can help you prepare a budget. Uh, there's a person who will um, review your write-up and help you with language and technical language uh, feedback. So know what resources are available. And the best way to know is talk to your advisor, talk to your faculty uh, mentors, ask them these questions, and they can point you to the right people. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit loaded, but the idea is very basic that how to, how to do this. Uh, now, in your case, if you are writing it individually, then you just need to make sure you know who are the people you need to talk to and get in touch with them early. But, uh, and if you are part of a team, then again, reach out to them. If it's a collaborative work with you and a faculty or you and another group of students, meet and set up some uh, uh, guidelines for yourself how to proceed. And what are those guidelines? One which is most important for me and I have learned the hard way is locking the idea. If you leave the idea open for too long, then it will never solidify into a proposal. It will stay open. And uh, when, when, especially when faculty, I mean, I'm, I'm a faculty, when faculty sit down, they are so curious, creative, explore, they want to explore everything, right? We, that's why we are faculty and doing research. We want to know everything. So when a couple of faculty sit down together, they, saw, they start throwing out ideas. And now what happens when you have too many ideas? It's hard to solidify. So somebody has to step up and say, we need to lock the idea. It usually can happen within a week, two weeks, whatever your timeline is, but locking is the key. Once you lock, the rest of the pathway, all of a sudden you will see becomes clear because you know what the goalpost is, then you have to identify the pathway. But goalpost is locking the idea. Um, after that, make sure from now to the goalpost, you set up your milestones. You know, when are we going to have our first draft prepared? If we need to get some preliminary data to, 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 to uh, support our our point of view. Do we need to talk to the program manager to get some more additional information about this? So um, create a timeline with clear products that you want to have in your hand on those dates. Prepare an outline of your proposal. Prepare an outline of your budget. Get, allocate money to different modules. You're not giving money to people, not giving money to faculty or students. You're giving money to the idea to a module that has a product associated with it. Whoever is doing it is a different part. You know, they will get maybe summer salary out of it. They might get some equipment out of it, uh, but you're paying money, you're allocating money in the budget for a product which your funding agency is going to need. Uh, once those things are sorted out, they, they don't have to be firm by the way, right in the beginning, but be fluid, they might, need some tweaking, changing as, as you proceed, but have a plan for those things and a plan for change. And then give writing responsibilities to each one. Now, this is where I wanna tell you something interesting. So 
you you know from these Greek you know mythologies about this perfect human, and there's a balance of muscles and there's a balance of body parts and the ratios. That's important in proposal too. Uh, you cannot have one part of the proposal bloated to you know out of proportion and then other parts like tiny and un, 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 unsatisfactory for a reviewer. It has to look nice. It has to look nice visually. It has to look nice from content's point of view. Uh, you can, as the reviewer is reading, you, you can give it to somebody else and get that feeling. Are you thirsty after reading first paragraph? Has the first paragraph met your desire to understand more? So those kind of things are important for you to know that the proposal overall must look balanced. Um, and then give submission responsibilities. Who's going to write? Who's going to be responsible for submitting? And uh, in writing, I now I do that, by the way, for each section, I set the number of uh, paragraphs or amount of text that I'm expecting to write, because otherwise it will go beyond and then it's hard to cut when somebody has put effort in writing you two pages it's it feels bad to cut their text afterwards so be upfront and say you know we are only expecting this much um a couple of other ideas that uh you know use technology to your advantage nowadays google docs i use it all the time we are simultaneously editing a document uh, we don't we are not nobody's keeping track of changes nobody's keeping track of versioning we can always find our oldest document on you know google drive um, it's keeping track of all of these things too much dependence on technology but you know it, it's working well for me uh, be firm and flexible when you're if you're leading a team be firm because you still are responsible for all of the things that you promise in a proposal uh, and be flexible because at the end of the day, you're working with people and people have needs, people have uh, urgencies and emergencies. So, you know, be flexible to deal with that. Uh, so once you have prepared your proposal, have another pair of eyes look at it. You can ask for somebody within your discipline. You can also ask somebody who is not in your discipline. So they have no idea about your language and they should still be able to take away something from it. Uh, finally, dot your I's, cross your T's, and submit, and then you know move on to your next project. Don't just sit there and wait for it. <laughs> Start working on the next proposal. Next slide, please. I think that was my last one. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's terrific. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll follow up. Plus, someone's posted a question in chat about who owns the idea if you get something funded. This aligns quite nicely, Evelyn, with a reviewer's perspective. So if you are a reviewer, whether an ad hoc, like a one-off review, or a panelist for a professional funding agency, you have to sign off on some agreement that says you won't take someone's idea from a proposal you're reviewing and run off and make it your next great idea. Uh, there are guidelines that restrict the ability of reviewers to do some of that. And there might be additional things with respect to patentable research about which I wouldn't know as much, but uh, there, there are protections in place that should preclude uh, uh, what you're asking about. And so you should have no reservations about putting forth really good ideas in proposals to get them funded. You should, your, a primary concern shouldn't be, say, intellectual property theft, as it were. Um, from a reviewer's vantage point, uh, we've heard a few comments thus far in this vein. Uh, let's just add a few more. And the first is that uh, if one is a panelist, you're reading a slew of proposals and it might be mid-semester and it might be late afternoon and by goodness, it might even be the year of COVID-19 and you're pretty strapped and you nonetheless see a pile of documents on your laptop awaiting review. Uh, so be mindful that these are humans that are looking at your work and they have their own foibles just as we all do in that vein. And what does that mean? make the, the reviewer's job easy. So that's the last bullet point there. I guess I'll jump to that first. Um, the jargon piece, while um, the technical terms and a lot of acronyms might be easy reading for some specialists, your, pan, your, your proposal might be read by people, even in something that seems like it shouldn't be outside a specialization purview, uh, it still might be. 
and, and so try to make sure whatever you're communicating is uh, uh, easy to follow for the people who are going to be reviewing that. And if you're not sure who that is, ask an advisor, ask other fellows, um, uh, fellow students. Um, nowadays on social media, you can often find people who might even be willing to share successful proposals or input in a way that can be helpful to you. Um, but what you want to target then is, is uh, a kind of proposal in which the, the technical pieces of the writing don't get in the way of the reviewer understanding the idea. So your explanations should be clear, succinct, easy to follow. Uh, there should be uh, very clear structuring early in the proposal. This is not a mystery novel in which we're going to get to the the end, you know, on page nine of a 10 page proposal, but rather we need to know from the time we're reading the abstract in, a, in the case of an NSF proposal, what are the intellectual, uh, what's the intellectual merit? What are the broader impacts? Those terms, which are the two governing review criteria that are going to be used by reviewers, the panel writ large and the program officer for making funding decisions um, among other key considerations. Uh, but those should even be perhaps in bold or some other way jump off the page from the abstract to other pieces of the proposal. Um, figures can be useful to visually convey what you know is core, like a model from which you're then uh, driving hypotheses that you're going to test. Make sure all sections of a proposal align. So uh, in other words, if you have a great idea in the intro, that that should be mirrored by the methods and that should be mirrored by, uh, say, expected results. And writing quality should be polished uh, throughout. Why? Again, all this is in the, the vein of this is a very competitive process and you've got humans reading all of these uh, proposals and uh, make their job as easy as possible. They will be paying very close attention to the review criteria like the NSF example given, but if it's some other funding agency, they'll also be equipped with guidelines of the criteria to employ. And as conscientious reviewers and panelists, those are the criteria they'll pay closest attention to ideally and give feedback consistent with those. Uh, but in some, you know, you might be looking at, depending on the, the target place, you know, maybe it's a 10% success rate, 15% success rate. Those are often in the ballpark for a lot of NSF type proposals, for example. And um, it, it's very competitive and that favors among other things, uh, again, making sure you put your best work forward. Uh, how else can you do that uh, from a reviewer's vantage? Uh, whatever you do submit, again, make sure you're getting feedback from others your advisor, advisors, uh, again, fellow students, others, including people who might be out, a little bit outside your discipline. They might be some of the best people to say, look, that's got too much jargon, or you've got 38 acronyms. I have no idea what these three mean. Um, you might forget to see the forest through the trees, and they might help you uh, in turn to see that. Uh, next slide. How should you receive feedback? So eventually you'll submit something, and then you'll wait. And then you'll wait, and then you'll wait. And this is good to be mindful that you may be waiting a very long time. And as we already heard, you might be waiting and get a rejection. And then you'll be thinking about the resubmission and how long do you have between, if you're going back to the same funding source, from rejection to resubmission, the turnaround times can vary. So be mindful of that. What if you're a third year student and you really wanna get going, um, and you're ready to go in three months, but you haven't yet put forth grant proposals, well, that timing isn't gonna align well. So you wanna be thinking of a calendar very, very far in advance. And from the kind of feedback you've already heard, probably thinking of scenarios in which you're putting out multiple proposals to uh, uh, agencies from, for which you have a legitimate chance of getting funding, but you'll also, knowing how competitive these processes are, anticipate rejection and resubmission and perhaps even multiple resubmissions. And it's wonderful, Dr. Marchand and Dr. Steven have shared their rejections. I still take rejection of stuff personally. We're told not to, uh, I can't help it. I just, it stings. The best thing you can do, go to sleep, uh, hug your loved ones or your dog or your cat or whatever, go to sleep, wake up next day after you've looked at the initial comments with the rejection and it's a new day and the sun still shines and you still got people around who care of you regardless of your grant outcome, and it's gonna be okay. Um, but uh, it, it, it's admittedly a tough thing to develop that thick skin that's necessary given that the success rates are not as high as we wish they could be, and that um, a lot of things will be put forth that just won't get funded. 
and yet you'll want to take that funding feedback to heart. If you get um, multiple rounds that are basically communicating, this is not a fundable idea, eventually you'll want to move on to something that is fundable. If you're getting feedback that says this could be fundable, but here are some things to attend to, don't ignore that feedback when you're moving forward, but rather take this as a wonderful opportunity to benefit from the feedback of thoughtful people who have devoted some of their time and effort to giving you feedback to allow you to do the best work that you can do. So treat it with the respect it deserves accordingly. Um, but that's all within the vein of how do you receive feedback, knowing that that feedback in some cases will be success, in which case your champagne toast, terrific. Your advisors and others will be cheering you on as well. Some of the highest moments I've experienced as a grad advisor are watching two of my PhD students get very competitive externally funded grant proposals that made possible their international field work without which it was gonna be very, very difficult to envision them doing that work financially. I get, I, don't, I won't say I'm as excited as they were when they got the, the award, but I was incredibly excited. Uh, and if it's not that, uh, that positive news, then again, uh, sleep on it and take it to heart and determine what the next steps in consultation with others, particularly say an advisor um, uh, might be. Um, that's probably sufficient to then pass it back uh, to the next slide. And then I think Dr. Stevens picking up here again. All right, so congratulations. You have been give, awarded the grant and now you have to do it. <laughs> uh, that's a common sentence I hear from faculty. We, we write each other, congratulations, we got the grant and they, then somebody says, but now we have to do it. <laughs> and that's where the grant management management comes into play. And the, the, this is a very important part of uh, a grant where now, uh, you know, not only you have to decipher what you wrote, <laughs> because often when we wrote, we had, sometimes we had an idea and reviewers are also human. So, they are sometimes unable to pick up all the all the uh, all the gaps that you may have left in your proposal your proposal came out to be the best among the proposals that they were reviewing that does not mean that this proposal is perfect okay so there are holes in the proposal and then they, they actually come back right after we start working on those grants we realize that oh, we were so vague here. So what are we going to deliver? You know, that is a very common question I run into. So what, what did we mean by it? Who wrote this? And some, sometimes say, who wrote this sentence? And then we ask them, oh, what are we supposed to do here? But eventually what we need to do is we figure out, we, we need to figure out, but there are steps that we need to follow. So first of all, know that there is a lot of support on campus available to help you run your grant. There are people who will help you administer different uh, aspects. So create connection with them, know all of them. Uh, know who is responsible. So they're called post award, uh, you know, part of the OSP. They will take care of all of your accounts, tell you how much money you have spent, tell you where you overspending, where you on track. Um, so make sure that you understand all of those, and they will also tell you exactly what you need to deliver. So they'll tell you your report is going to be due a year from now, a second one two years from now, a third one three years from now, and then, you know, whatever the other reports are due. So they'll tell you the dates and put them in your calendar because your future funding is determined by your ability to deliver in your current funding uh, deliverables. So, and not only as a PI, so I'm a PI, I have a lot of co-PI. If I make a mistake, my co-PIs will be dinged on their future proposals too. So these deliverables are very serious. Uh, and so, and it's it's accountability too. We, we just agreed to use private or public sector money to do some good. I mean, of course, our intent is to do some good with that money, a good that is of mutual benefit. We are gonna get publications out of it. We might get some recognition out of it, patents out of it. You graduate some students. As students, you might get some papers 
and ability to go to your you know PhD or your professional postdoc uh, with better you know stronger abilities. Uh, so there's a lot of accountability here. So understand what you're responsible for, what you need to deliver, and plan. Set up your your plan based on that. So Gwen, you have the next part. Sure. Um, are we on the next slide or just the next part of this one? The, there we go. Um, so I think some of the things that are really critical, um, especially if you're working with a team, is to develop Sorry, a plan. It said, that, it said that you're going to build on the previous slide. Um, I know this slide I am is- happy so. to I am happy. <laughs> I'm happy to build. <laughs> you did such a good job. I have very little to add. Um, I just had put some. I had just put a couple of comments into the notes to um, to kind of build on what, there, what Dr. Stephen was recommending. So um, sometimes it people get, don't realize what are in the condition of their grant. Right. So making sure that at the very beginning of your grant period, you set up a time with that post award specialist and go through the terms and conditions related to that grant so that you understand if you want to move money around, for example, or um, is it allowable? Can you do it? So a lot, oftentimes we'll wait until we want to do that in order to ask that question or we might think in our heads, oh, I'm not spending this money now, but it's okay. I'll just, I'll spend it later on something else or a unexplained, you know, the proposals that you submit, as Dr. Steven is saying, sometimes as we get into the work, things change and we need to modify our plans. Um, and so we might have the assumption that we can just do that. And it's important to, if you get an idea of what the grant, it's called the terms of the award or award conditions at the very beginning and you read those thoroughly and you ask the questions of your post award specialist, it can help you plan for the life of your grant. And if the grant's big enough, or if you have the opportunity um, as a student to be a project manager for a grant or to serve in that capacity, you will learn the business of grants intimately because now you're at the point where you don't want the business of doing the grant to take over the intellectual nourishment that you get from doing the work that is the reason that you applied for the grant in the first place. So thinking about how to balance those and how to leverage those resources that are available to you or even hire a grant manager if it's a big enough grant um, can really help to, to leave you that intellectual space for the joy of doing the research. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to just build on and add there is don't wait too long to spend your money. <laughs> so, this is another thing that happens a lot where we're kind of doing the work, doing the work, think we're doing a great job, and then um, we get to the near the end of our grant and suddenly you get pressure from people to spend down on your award. Well, sometimes it's, you know, you should be spending along the way as you planned because that's what that money was intended to, intended to buy you a, a office full of computer toner at the end of your grant, which is going to be awful to say that you're spending that money in the service of, of doing the grant. So it's just basic time management and project management is a critical piece of grants that are often undervalued. I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. I think we're yeah, on so the next one. Yeah, thanks. All right, so I have two more slides. I'll, I'll wrap up this in the next couple of minutes. Um, so develop an end-to-end -end plan. I think uh, it kind of a, is a good segue from the budgetary ability to spend all the money. If you have an end-to-end -end plan, you will know when you will need to buy supplies, when you will need to spend money. And that way you will not have a lot of large chunk of money waiting at the end to be spent. By the way, if you are unable to spend the money, some agencies allow no cost extension. That means they give you one more year or six more months to extend your work and be, be able to spend that money. Um, but as you're as you're preparing this plan, convert your objectives into milestones, milestones into actual tasks, and then on top of that, tasks into who is responsible. If you put a name on a task, somebody's accountable, it will most likely get done. Set up some ethics between your team, expectations, how to accomplish. Internal evaluation is key. You need to be able to evaluate yourself. 
are we on track? If you have milestones, you'll be able to do that. Um, have recurring meetings with your team. So if you're a grad student, have recurring teams uh, uh, meetings with your advisor. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it should be part of your calendar. So I, 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 if you're an instructor, it should be like you are teaching a class. If you are a student, it's like you're taking a class. It should be in your schedule. You need to be attending to your grant work every week at some point. Um, if you need to hire somebody to work to work for you, then hire early, hire well. Uh, know that you as a principal investigator are responsible for everything on that grant. You are on the hook. So if you need to send reminders to people, you need to accommodate their ur urgencies and emergencies, uh, give them timely feedback, it's all your responsibility. So you have to come across as firm as well as flexible. So those are two different characteristics, but you can have both if you try hard. <laughs> um, and then keep keep your eyes on the prize. And what is the prize? The prize is, first of all, the satisfaction you get from doing intellectual work, original novel, scientific work, uh, that we all aspire to do. That's why you are in graduate school. That's why we are faculty, because that's what we want to do. We want to do, we want to reach the, the cutting edges of our knowledge and extend them. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, during the process, don't lose the track that you are there because you're curious, you're learning new skills. Um, stay away from rabbit holes, by the way, in proposals. Because we are curious, we get attracted to every curiosity. And some of these could be really deep rabbit holes. So uh, recognize, turn around, stay, because at the end, you your, your deliverables are the measuring uh, factors not how much effort you put in, in going into a rabbit hole. Uh, regularly collect data about your proposal and keep track of it. Um, and lastly, uh, but not least, make sure you engage in social activities with your team and you know people uh, because that's what binds us all together and gives us the ability to coexist and work uh, for better uh, for betterment and for good outcomes. And that's the key. You, if your team is solid, uh, you for sure will be able to develop, uh, complete your proposal. So I think that, that that's the end of my part. Going back to giving it to back to you, Peter. Yeah, and uh, you see two links there. Uh, one is to the Office of Sponsored Projects, OSP at UNLV, and also another to the library. The I think both of them go to Pivot, which again is a takeaway from today's workshop. We're pressing up against five. Um, there have been, knowing this is going to be recorded and the chat won't appear to those watching the recording, there have also been some comments posted in chat. Uh, one of those takeaways from a recent thread was about uh, what happens if you uh, request a, an extension or um, can you lose funds? I think we, we heard some uh, discussion in that vein. I ultimately check with the particular funding source uh, because some may have flexibility, some may not. Um, at this point, since we're up about five, but uh, we may have time for questions unless Nevena says we have to absolutely cut at five. Otherwise, I would say if, if, if allowable, could we let students post questions and comments in chat or if, um, if also feasible, maybe to unmute yourself. And Nevena, if you could go to the last slide while we wait to see if there might, any be, might be any questions. Um, make some magic, make some magic. We can't go to a magic show on the strip right now. They're all shut down during COVID-19, but you can go to the seven magic mountains just south of Las Vegas and see some magically colored rocks or at least some version of this in addition to the funding that you strive and we hope succeed getting. So I don't see any current posts in chat with questions at this juncture. If you have any, feel free, again, with all three of us here, it's a okay. question about the extension, and I think when you mentioned not all states allow no cost extension, is that right? Yeah, just that depending on the funding source, it can it can change. So, for example, I work on state grants that are constrained by the fiscal year budget, and in many cases, those cannot be extended 
Um, but you can also, if you're in a multi-year grant, you can carry forward unused funds from one year to the next. You just have to rebudget for those and request them. So like Dr. Gray was saying, you just have to kind of know the particulars of the funder and ask. And that's what your post award folks are there for to help address those questions. Anything else? Looks like uh, Peter's speaking, but he's on mute. <laughs> Oops, that would help. Uh, uh, Nikki had posted a comment in chat about the uh, UNLV library resources, and that link is posted in chat, but also I think you saw it in the slide. Uh, if, if uh, again, you're just watching the recording, you just go to the UNLV library, look up research, but again, Pivot is just outstanding. Uh, plus, you can save your searches, so you don't have to um, you know, write them down somewhere else and then lose them, uh, but rather you can keep a running uh, log of what you found that might be relevant for as funding sources with keyword searches in your trajectory. And I'm sure if anybody has follow up questions, I, I, if you want to email any, I'm, I can't speak for my fellow presenters, but um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions via email or anything else. Yeah, likewise, I'm happy to answer questions and help any part. Feel free to email me, haroon.stephen at unlv.edu. So it looks no like- No pressure, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free as well. I'll be, I'll be sitting right here in this chair. I'm not going anywhere for the next few months. Um, so it looks like we don't have any other questions, but before we wrap up today, I just wanted to give a really huge thank you to our facilitators. Um, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. This was so informative and insightful. I'm sure our participants uh, appreciated it very much. Um, and then thank you to all of our participants for joining us for today's workshop. Um, just as a reminder, we're going to be posting this to the Graduate College YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, so you can go back and refer to it. Um, for any of the um, things maybe you forgot to take notes on. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your night and we'll see you at our next workshop. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, good night.